Welcome, good morning, good evening um, and good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for joining our, uh, our webinar on DPC v4. Uh, we'll give it a, just a couple more seconds just to allow any uh, final people to, to make their way in and then we'll get started. lovely stuff. Um, so um, thank you for, for joining us. My name's uh, Leo Darcy. I'm the Head of Identity and Access here at Power on Platforms and I'm also one of the lead developers of uh, DPC product. I'm uh, joined uh, this morning um, by Richard. Thank you very much for, for joining. My pleasure. Um, and um, I, we're also joined by my colleague Damien Shield, who's Senior Consultant. Hi there, Rob. So uh, today what we're going to be kind of running through is kind of what's uh, what's new with uh, DPC v4. Um, we're going to give you a nice demo of what that looks like in Windows 11 and also managed uh, kind of fully via, via Intune in a kind of Azure AD um, uh, only managed way. So there's no domain join, there's no none of that. Obviously the domain join stuff and group policy, uh, none of that's going away but um, we are just kind of showing you the, the other possibilities um, around, around some of that stuff now. Then have a, uh, a discussion around the kind of current state of AOVPN in Windows 11. We've just had some major important patches land. There's still some outstanding bugs, et cetera. We'll kind of dig into what that looks like and um, kind of where kind of Richard's thoughts are, where our thoughts are around some of that stuff. And then we're going to get a sneak peek from my colleague Damien, Damien on um, the a new uh, product that Paron are going to be bringing to market um, soon, um, which allows us to do kind of unified reporting um, around our VPN. That's very exciting for us as well. And we'd love to see um, your, your thoughts and feedback on that. And then we're finally going to finish the session off today um, with an open Q&A. So with that being said, please do get your um, uh, questions into the chat. Um, where appropriate, we'll um, try and um, go through some of them um, during the call. And if not, we'll, we'll go through them at the end. And if we do run out of time during the call, what we'll do is we'll, we'll feed back um, uh, remotely uh, to, to answer any other questions that are submitted. So, um, <clears throat> DPC v4, it's a uh, it's a relatively major release for us, um, bringing Windows 11 support. Um, this was something that we we tried to or we wanted to um, kind of do from day one of Windows 11, but unfortunately there was a number of kind of bugs in the platform that uh, stopped us from from initially being able to offer it in the same way as Windows 10. So while nine, uh, um, Microsoft kind of advertised 99.7% application compatibility between um, uh, Windows 10 and Windows 11, unfortunately AOVPN is very much that 0.3, which is, um, or has, has certainly had some issues, shall we say. So uh, to kind of get around some of those issues, what we've ended up having to do is uh, do a major rewrite of the profile management engine, effectively stripping out air, some of the broken APIs and replacing them with some alternatives that we managed to find and develop that allowed us to get the information that we needed um, to, to enable the product to, to function as we, we want and you guys expect. So it wasn't all kind of bad news from that perspective. Um, doing this kind of major rewrite has also allowed us to find and fix a number of bugs in that, that engine. Um, and it has certainly made things more consistent and the code base is certainly um, better for it, I would say. Um, we're not stopping there at all. Um, we are bringing, uh, so, the the version four release there's not a huge amount in there apart from the uh, the Windows 11 uh, elements. So if you're not planning on Windows 11, um, it's still worth upgrading uh, from the for the consistency perspective. But what we're now going to be or what we're now looking forward at is kind of version 4.1, which we're hoping to get out in the next kind of couple of months. 
and uh, part of that is um, around some of the new features that are being released in 20, uh, Windows 11 22 H2. Um, so Richard, are you able just to kind of talk through oh, yes. what those, those will be? Yes, absolutely. So um, for those of you who follow my blog at directaccess.richardix.com, I just posted an update this week, earlier this week. Microsoft introduced some changes um, in the VPN v2 CSP, the configuration service provider, exposing a few more settings uh, that we can manipulate in the CSP using XML, um, at, which are helpful. Uh, two of those are available today in Windows 11 22H2. That would be uh, disabling the disconnect VPN button, which has been a huge ask probably since day one. And uh, yep. the second one is disabling the uh, advanced settings. Uh, you know, the uh, users can't get into the advanced settings of the VPN profile. So those two settings are available today. Microsoft updated the documentation for this. And I again, you can find that uh, on my website. But as I noted in the in the blog post, uh, the documentation is is uh, somewhat inaccurate. So first of all, there was a group of settings, but only two of them are available today, and they managed to get the version wrong. So the documentation on the website today says it's available in Windows 11 21 H2. That is incorrect. Uh, you can disable the disconnect button and prevent access to advanced settings in Windows 11 22 H2 and later. And then there was another group of settings like disabling um, uh, Ike Mobility, disable it or uh, uh, changing the um, interface metric on the VPN interfaces. Those unfortunately are not available even in 22H2. Those are uh, going to be supported in a future release of Windows. Um, if you want to road test those, however, you can uh, enable or enroll in the Windows 11 Insider program and choose the uh, dev channel. So in the development channel, you do have access to those settings and you can see how they operate there. And I think, uh, and Leo, you can speak to this. I think what's going to happen is DPC does those things today, but we do them in a, a very different way. And so I would imagine that you'll just pivot to use those interfaces as they're available, correct? That's absolutely correct. So, um, for 4.1, what we'll look to do is bring in the options edit button and the disconnect button, um, because those are capabilities that we don't currently offer um, in the product today. Mm -hmm. um, we're also um, looking to introduce the ability to customize the MTU size. It's um, ah, yes. kind of a bit out there for most customers. Most customers don't need to worry about that, um, but we've had an ask from a couple of customers now um, where that solves a very specific issue within their networks and within mm -hmm. their ISPs that they deal with. Um, so we're hopefully Good. going to bring that to the next one. Excellent. Um, and another one that's quite exciting from my perspective is we're hoping to bring the ability to automatically trigger a profile update or refresh based on when GP update is run rather than just kind of linearly on uh, the the, the current refresh timer. So that should hopefully allow um, devices to be more in line with the, the configuration that's being provided to them. Outstanding. And then, yeah, as you absolutely said, for those, that new block of settings um, that isn't being released in the CSP till kind of V next, mm -hmm. um, most of those settings we can already handle today through various interfaces. Um, the way that we will still want to continue to have access to those interfaces uh, for backwards compatibility, because this is only going to be, say, um, uh, 23H2, Windows right, 11, yeah. etc. We don't want to suddenly cut off support for Windows 10 or um, any of the uh, <laughs> earlier versions of Windows 11. Um, but what we'll certainly look to do is take advantage of them where it makes sense um, and add any new features in. Um, uh, as we don't or, uh, where we don't already have those capabilities. Fantastic. So um, moving on to kind of a Windows 11 demo, the way we've got it currently set up is if oh, I just have to refresh that. And I'll jump back to uh, so what we've got is a virtual machine in our demo environment. And that's running Windows 11, it's 22H2. 
and it's pure Azure AD join. There's no Active Directory domain involved with this particular with this specific um, uh, VM at all. So what we've done is we've um, presented out the user tunnel and the device tunnel. With uh, Azure AD only devices, you generally only want to be deploying the user tunnel, mainly because there's very little value in the device tunnel because all of the pre logon authentication and systems and things like that are pretty much all internet facing anyway. Um, and then as uh, Richard uh, kind of rightly pointed out earlier, uh, you also have the issue where the device tunnel won't always automatically start up on an Azure AD only device. So kind of looking at what it takes to kind of get to that setup from an Intune perspective, um, we've obviously got our Intune tenant and the first thing we've got to do is get the application uh, deployed. So this is just grabbing the MSI from the usual downloads location and assigning it out to either your devices or your users. And there's no additional configuration here. It's pretty much a next, 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 for, or it's about next, next from an Intune perspective. <laughs> it's really that simple. There's minimal information you've got to put in apart from where you want to start categorizing things for your own internal usage, et cetera. And then we get on to the device configuration. So what we'll just show you firstly is the certificate management. So um, we've still got an on-prem uh, PKI system, but we are presenting those certificates out via Intune uh, to allow, allow them to be trusted both from a device and from a user MPS perspective. So we've got the root and the issuing authorities just to uh, allow the chain of trust. And then we've got the PKCS certificates here for both the user and the device. And those could be SCEP based certificates depending on your personal preferences around um, SCEP versus PKCS. So that effectively is all the prerequisites for getting a, a AOVPN tunnel up and operational. What we then need to do is configure uh, DPC. So the first thing that we need to do is go over to this new import ADMX location. And it's worth pointing out that this is all kind of a feature of Microsoft Intune. It's just a, a advantageous for DPC and for our kind of customers uh, using DPC that the, these capabilities now exist within, uh, within the Microsoft stack. So the first thing you've got to do is um, you've got to import the Windows ADMX uh, because the, the, the DPC ADMX kind of has some dependencies on it. Uh, Microsoft know that this is kind of a, co a common um, requirement. So as part of the pre, oh, sorry, as they kind of move towards general availability on this feature, they are looking to kind of hide the need for the windows.admx because they already kind of control that one anyway. So why make, make the extra kind of e effort? But just to kind of show you what that looks like from an importing perspective, we can just go, go to here, it's C, Windows, policy definitions. And then if it's the Windows one you need, you just select Windows.admx. And if it's the power on DPC one, you just select power on DPC um, on any install, on any computer where those, uh, where we've, you've already installed the DPC agent. And then the, the associated language files are under ENUS. And you will find that there as well. And you just hit the import and wait about a minute for it to kind of do its processing. It's probably worth mentioning at this point that there is a limitation on the importing of ADMXs. So um, you, if you try and say we've got, if we publish the 4.0 version today and we want to bring in that those new features in 4.1 we need to update the admx files so that customers can take advantage of those additional features um, unfortunately there's no real way to upgrade the admx's in intune at this time if you um so there, there's effectively two ways you can kind of do that uplift you either have to delete all of your profiles and the import admx's which is certainly risky to most customers because you're then removing the profiles from the end user devices. That's 
generally not okay. Um, and then the other alternative is that we create a differencing ADMX. So a ADMX that has only the new settings in it. It doesn't have any of the old settings on it um, and then import that separately. If there's any customers that, that need to do that approach, uh, then we are um, more than willing to, to work with customers to, to build those differencing ADMXs as they need them. Microsoft have acknowledged that this is an issue and are looking to uh, manage that on the back end um, in a much better way, but there's no ETA on that at this point. I would suspect that it's a post general availability feature from, from their perspective. The other thing to note with the differencing um, ADMXs is that you are limited to 10 um, imported ADMXs at any time. So if you've just got the DPC ones, then that gives you multiple opportunities to add the differencing settings in. Um, if you've got lots of other ones, for example, we've got this drive mapping one um, that obviously cuts into the number of uh, ADMXs you can import. But kind of going to what that looks like once you have done that import and you, you want to kind of configure those settings, um, what we've done is we've split the configuration into device tunnel and user tunnel because that allows us to put the user tunnel onto all devices while um, kind of assigning the device tunnel settings only to those kind of hybrid domain joint devices as when they need them. Um, but you could also kind of wrap it all into one policy. There's no real um, technical reason why you need to go one way or the other. And then what we can see here is a list of the settings that have been configured. And if we go in, we can see the initial set of oh, where I, I've already configured these things. So, for example, the MPS radius list, and these are all the settings that you kind of know and love um, already from a group policy perspective, if you're already running operating it on prem. And if you want to see how that looks from a, if I need to add a new setting in, it looks uh, an awful lot like the administrative templates section of group policy, which is kind of by design. So here's a nice new setting there we can configure. Then it's just review, save. And then we can just run um, company the, the company portal to force a sync or just let it, it sync naturally over time. Outstanding. And by the way, just to just to mention a, a quick bug here in Windows 11 with regards to Intune Sync, that is still an outstanding issue. Uh, so for those of you running Windows 11, you may notice that uh, potentially that there are a loss of connectivity periodically throughout the day. Um, there's a known issue that Microsoft is aware of and is working to address where only on Windows 11, any VPN profiles, always on VPN profiles, are automatically removed and replaced every time there's a device sync, even when there are no changes to the profile. So again, um, if you're going to go this route, it's a fantastic way to do this. Um, just be aware that there is a limitation in Windows 11 with Intune today that hopefully will get fixed in the near future. Yeah, is that dedicated to when Intune's managing the profiles or kind of across the board? Um, so the good question. I don't know if it affects this because you're right. Um, that may just affect using native, uh, using their device template and using the um, uh, using their device template and using um, or using custom XML. But in this case, since you're managing this somewhat differently, this may not apply. So that, that's a good point. I suspect that it's because of the, the the bugs with the enumeration of the existing profiles, so it doesn't necessarily yeah, understand so, what they so are. So we did we did some testing with that. Uh, right. As soon as we had the private fix for that last year, I had my customer test that, and uh, it didn't it didn't change things, unfortunately. So so That's I guess I, I guess as a way of stating this, um, DPC is a workaround for that bug today because I would assume it doesn't affect you because you're implementing the the the, the profile natively locally. Locally, right all we're doing yeah. all we're doing with Intune is pushing out the software and making the settings available you know via ADMX so that is principally different than how they are managing it with Windows uh, with Intune today so that's a good idea so another another selling point for DPC on Intune yeah 
the other reason why we do um like apart from the kind of the issues that we mentioned earlier um i would uh, it's my kind of personal opinion that moving to intune for vpn management is, is a really nice workflow um the key kind of reason for that is that you get to do the out of band updates so all you need is your device to have internet right. access and we can kind of configure that vpn from anywhere absolutely which, <laughs> Absolutely, that's a huge win, and and also the advantage to DPC is that, um, you know, we've built in all of these advanced features and capabilities. Yeah. That, uh, yes, of course, you could go and do them all, most of them or all of them yourselves, and you know, a lot of them are documented. But at the end of the day, uh, it's a lot of moving parts. So you would have to write the PowerShell scripts, create the proactive remediations, and handle all of that. Uh, and of course, the assumption here, like we talked about last uh, on our last call is that you would know about all of these things, right? The advantage to DPC here is that we've got tons of experience, best practice uh, alignment built into the solution. So it's kind of point, click and ship. Um, and uh, it, 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 uh, it, for me, this was a huge win when Microsoft came out with custom ADMX because it, prior to that, it was a niche product that would really only address those scenarios where you're going to manage uh, using Active Directory group policy on premises. But when Microsoft introduced this feature, all of a sudden that just opened up a whole new world because now we can take advantage of of all of those things in DPC that make it a powerful tool and still get the advantage of using modern management and out of band management. So that's a huge win for sure. Yep. Uh, lovely. So. Um, AO VPN in Windows 11. It's uh, certainly been a rocky ride, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is not quite fully baked, surprisingly, because we've had two releases, 11, uh, uh, 22, uh, 21 H2 and now 22 H2, and we're approaching uh, potentially 23 H2 at the end of this year. And we're still struggling with a lot of things in Windows, in, in Always on VPN with Windows 11. Uh, we have a, there was a bug in, for those of you who may or may not be aware, there was a bug in, um, in the in Windows 11 introduced with the with the introduction of Windows 11 that prevented the enumeration of a, of a WMI class that was rather critical to supporting always on VPN. And so um, uh, I I had several of my customers open up support cases, power on and, and, and Leo open support cases. We ultimately got Microsoft to produce a fix and they released that fix last month. So uh, end of February is when that came out. And sadly, it was available only for Windows 11 21 H2. Uh, when we pushed back and, and asked why it wasn't released for you know 22 H2, uh, Microsoft's response was that nobody asked for it. So of course, we, uh, we had a, a good chuckle at that because when we started this, uh, um, uh, when we started this, it was probably last June or July, I think. It's been 18 um, months in the making. Right, and so <laughs> there was no 22H2. We couldn't have possibly asked for it. It didn't exist, right? So anyway, Microsoft is aware that uh, they've only released it for 21H2. It's coming for 22H2, I would expect at some point, hopefully soon, because ultimately they, they I think they have the fix. They just need to push it out. So we'll see how that goes, uh, but that's that's been challenging for sure. Yeah, um, so that's the 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 real core one that's been blocking a lot of people both with dpc without dpc um from kind of really shifting um uh, over but there's um as as you kind of previously mentioned there is some new development going in which is quite exciting isn't it because um i don't know about you but i've off, um uh, at times questioned whether microsoft would continue to invest in <laughs> aovpn or whether they yeah. would go kind of pure you don't need a vpn which sure i i like like it, it sounds great it's theoretically possible for some i would certainly sure. say for the majority they're going to need a vpn for a good few years yeah yeah no question no question um, but yeah, there's a couple of other bugs that um, we kind of encountered as we were uh, uh, building DPC v4. Um, so just to kind of put these out there for those that uh, might also encounter these things, um, just know that you're you're not alone on these. Um, just be aware that if you are using traffic filters and you set the remote addresses um, attribute on that, 
um, you can actually get some rather interesting uh, WMI crashes. Uh, so you can't um, add or remove profiles of our WMI interface anymore. Uh, the only way I believe that you can get around that is to kill the profile through something like Razphone slash X. Mm. Um, and then that, whatever it is, it, it unbreaks WMI so you can <laughs> use it again. Um, but that's a relatively niche case because there's very few customers actually running traffic filters. Um, one of the the weird ones that we kind of ran into with DPC was that when you do finally get that response back from um, the WMI enumeration, if you've got any device tunnels um, where RAS phone or like in the RAS phone, it will say, yes, this is a device tunnel. Um, the response from the WMI in, uh, query will actually say, no, this isn't a device tunnel. So at least at one point when we were uh, in the testing phases, um, uh, that that's just something to be aware of in case you kind of ha end up going around the uh, kind of round houses trying to work out why this thing is uh, uh, isn't a device tunnel when it is um, <laughs> is that there there are some uh, I'd say graphical bugs around that because it does fully function as a device tunnel as you would expect. Mm -hmm. um, and then the 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 one that is kind of most important to to people that are, um, in our experience is that when you are using the device tunnel in Windows 11, there's a uh, a bug at the moment where it um, will tattoo the first device profile name into the operating system uh, somewhere. Um, we we've tried looking at where it is to try and remediate this, but we've had no success so far. But what it effectively does is that if you then remove that profile and try and add a new device profile of a different name, it will actually send an error saying there's a, de a device tunnel already exists, which is patently untrue because <laughs> browserphone.pbk is empty, all the WMI enumeration is empty. Wow. Um, um, and the only way the only ways that we've been able to kind of solve this and in DPC, we do allow you to change the device tunnel name because we have a workaround and that workaround is actually to track the original name that was used on that device and then always add the profile in with that original name and then call a rename function later, which does work for for whatever reason. But unfortunately, <laughs> good, good times. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, the, if you don't know what the original name was, the only way that we've been able to um, reset that at this time, and we've tried multiple different approaches, the only way we've been able to do it is to do a factory reset on the device, which is wow. not ideal for most customers. No, nope, not at all. So um, yeah, if you guys do see that, um, just be aware that you it, it is it is a bug in the operating system. Um, unfortunately, there's not a huge amount that we can do. We we have or we are raising it with Microsoft. If you guys also have uh, Microsoft support contracts, um, then we would very much value additional um, requests to Microsoft uh, because they will generally prioritize based on the size of the customer requesting and the number of requests. <laughs> yep. So um, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Damien uh, to talk through our very exciting new product. Hi there all. Um, yeah, really excited to um, uh, give a first peek to this uh, to the world. So if you just bear with me, I'm just going to share my screen. Well, se second peek, we saw it this morning. Second peek. <laughs> so, uh, I was trying to be. Um... Yeah, there you go. There we go. Everyone can see that OK? Yeah, yeah we got it. Yep. Okay, so uh, so what is the solution um, and why it exists? Uh, just as with DPC, it was created to uh, fill a gap, as it were, um, in in the functionality of of the product. And one of the major uh, challenges when it comes to um, a VPN, it's not a central. Uh, it is not a discrete product in itself. It's a combination of RAS, it's a combination of um, 
radius authentication when using NPS. It's got your network devices involved and obviously the endpoints as well. So there's a lot of moving parts on it. And often when I was doing deployments at the end of it, um, you know, knowledge transfer sessions, we'd come to the reporting part of it. And it would be, is that it? Um, which is something that I've had experience of before with other, um, some of the other Microsoft um, uh, consoles and the reporting capabilities around it. It sort of goes there, but it's often then a third party uh, solution that, that fixes it. Um, so that was primarily the, the, the main reason is that it's very difficult to be able to see all of your servers and connections in one place and then be able to then find it and centralize it by either a device, a user um, or an IP address or it, it, all of the different factors. You, you have to then do that and repeat that search each time per server, uh, which can be time consuming. So um, that's why the solution exists. It was basically to try and extend and enhance and centralize uh, the reporting uh, from the direct, uh, what mimics the direct, um, the, the reporting services side, not the RAS, but the, 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 the actual uh, reporting side um, for the solutions. So the solution um, uh, is going to be in a couple of parts. So it is an agent that will be running on the VPN servers or the RAS servers specifically, um, and then also an Azure storage account, which will then be the repository for the data, and then Power BI as the reporting mechanism and the, the, the dashboarding mechanism. So I must stress as well that Power BI is not a monitoring dashboard, so there will always be time. There will be always a, an historic view of what's going on. But as with everything, we can uh, do ad hoc refreshes um, and uh, schedule it, certainly using and leveraging the Power BI. So it will eventually be um, uh, um, a published app within the marketplace. Um, and so, so this is the landing page um, uh, made. Uh, more beautiful on on um, the request of Mr. Hicks, and it's <laughs> effectively uh, tries to be an overview. So this is the first stab at it. Um, this will only grow and develop and change over time to reflect what most people uh, would want to see um, on it, almost like the morning coffee um, dashboard we used to get in Operations Manager for the Veeam uh, Management Pack solution. Um, a nice overview um, gives uh, usage here on client connections, concurrent connections broken down by server, active connections, how many, what spare connections do we have, you know. So at a glance, the idea would be to say, yeah, the VPN services is running correctly, the actual server is running um, as it should do, addressing's working, um, we've got the cert, uh, all good, that kind of that kind of usage. Um, so then effectively we look at the server overview. So looking a bit more in depth at the servers and the configuration. And so these are produced from two data sets. So when the agent runs on the VPN server, what it will do it will first of all take the information from the reporting services database, which is a WID database normally uh, that runs locally on there. It takes those files and throws them up to, uh, to an Azure storage account. The second data set is performance metrics and configurational data, which is <clears throat> what we're seeing here. And the idea is that we've got these two data sets that mesh, but also do different things. So the, the reporting database side of it will give the detailed connection about historical data, whilst the performance is very much giving um, a snapshot of now and then historically as well, but it's more around the configuration and the performance side of it um, rather than just the um, uh, just the historical RS data. So the idea is then we're extending the capabilities that are there currently at the moment, centralizing them and then adding a couple of little cherries, which will hopefully um, people will see the uh, benefit in. 
Uh, the second page, the VPN server configuration, is then looking at the IP pool configuration, the certificate, the authentication, the radius servers, and then some more generalized information about server. It's a little bit busy at the moment, but um, uh, as I say, we're running with six servers here, um, and this is where we're going to, um, you know, tidy up over time and make that a bit more streamlined. So as you see, we have got filters and slices up here. Um, and what we were able to do then is be able to give then much more centralized information on just a single server if you need to sort of drill down into that. And that because it's Power BI, obviously that then carries on to the next page, which is lovely because then that gives us uh, that continuity um, if we're flicking between the different perspectives of a single box or server um, and uh, gives us that overall look at it. So these first uh, these first three are uh, effectively the performance data set that we're bringing up from the machines. Um, the the last three, uh, well, last four really, are these are then derived from the um, from the reporting services database itself. So as you see, we've still got the filter on there. If I take some of that off now. So this is all the data over from a specific set in time. So because again, it's uh, Power BI, we can um, uh, move this up and down and tweak it to the specific data set that we want to look at. But one of the nice features is here is I can go in and have a look at a specific user and then immediately see what servers they've been on, what times they've been on, um, add an overview. So what we're trying to achieve here is being able to give a bird's eye view of the infrastructure where required, and then also being able to drill down into detail. And being able to get this kind of graphical representation of your connection history um, is just simply not possible with the native tools. Um, and I feel and we feel that this gives um, a, a better reflection of, of it. Now this is just using sample data at the moment, so they're not it's not massively representative. Um, uh, when larger data sets are brought into it, it does uh, start to uh, give a little bit more uh, information on there and you can start to see trends. But as I say, this is this is test data at the moment. I'm going to clip over um, client distribution for a second and have a look at configure connection detail. Now this is where it really, really does start to sing. So um, if I bring this up first of all and give us all of it. So we can see I'm looking at all the servers across all the users on here. Um, we can drill down on each server first of all to each client to each timestamp. So we can see on a specific ses session where the uh, endpoints were on this side here um, and also if I can see yeah so as you can see here the we've actually got resolved names which is nice it also then gives us the service name the protocol name and the port which are there in the native tools but the service friendly name is not the resolvable DNS name if it is resolvable is not there and so it gives hopefully a little bit more context around what the um, users are connecting to and uh, can identify either issues or trends or use that information for whatever is is required in there but it will give then all the details which is in the reporting services um, reporting as is now but give it in a holistic and in one place without having to click from page to page to page and to to understand where you're going so um so yeah, absolutely. So and then if we have a look at the client distribution, uh, we can see uh, we've got connections by server, client connection. Th this is likely to be relatively fluid, driven by what people want uh, to be able to, to see on there. And uh, that will on only hope um, to, to really start to flourish and to, to start giving real value uh, in the information and data that it, it brings back to you. And then the last one, is data flow. So very simply, how much data has flowed in and out of the pipes for whatever servers, for whatever users over a certain given time. So 
these are early days with this. Um, still wrestling with some large database uh, issues um, where we're just trying to make that as efficient as possible um, and to uh, obviously not sync machines uh, and do all of that. So we're, um, you know, very conscious, as Leo said, I think it was on the previous session. This, these are critical servers when you've got people connecting in remotely, um, uh, especially when you haven't got in tune um, uh, as, a, as an out of bound stuff. And, the, you know, if the service goes down then that this is something we're very very careful uh, around so we're doing working some uh, very early adopters just to just to make sure that um, it can handle representative database sizes um, so where are we going with it um, what I'd like to see, so um, I, uh, I glossed over the fact that there was actually an IPv6 address there, looking to make sure that that's nice and robust uh, because Mr Hicks keeps asking me for it. Um, <laughs> Uh, so make sure that the IPv6 is supported and also server core. So um, uh, the, the two things that will will just become more prevalent over time. So we want to try and bake that into it. I want we want to try and get a lot of SSL and Ike certification in and separate those out, especially when you're using SSTP using a public CA certificate. I want to obviously try and bring that information in separately to the moment. Uh, just try and get a bit more performance and configurational data. Um, we managed eventually to get the um, the spare connections coming through, uh, which were not being used by RAS and which were, which, which is just one number in a table, but it took a, a, an in order in, in <laughs> a disproportionate time to be able to get that working. It was a red key in the end. Um, future, future plans. Um, uh, hopefully it would be nice to see MP I, I will say these these are absolutely wants to at the moment they're, they're not in concrete but uh want to try and include the MPS side of it potentially the network devices that there to give start giving that historic view uh, or holistic view I should say because when in former life I was an operations manager um, um, a specialist and Monitoring AOVPN had its challenges using that because you're looking at the network devices, you're looking at NPS, you're looking at VPN uh, or RS servers. So it's that those those combination of it. So eventually I'd love to see that, but this is not a monitoring solution per se. This is to be able to give us insight over those details. Um, and from a usability perspective, uh, uh, what I love to get to in the end of it is where the report is customizable by the end user to be able to change if they don't like the line value or the line chart to be able to, to, to be able to do that. But we are where we are with it at the moment. We're in early days um, and um, yeah, just really excited to, to show it off to the world. So yeah. It looks fantastic and I think this is going to be a huge win for for anybody who's deployed always on VPN and has more yeah. than one server, you know, because again, VPN servers are standalone, you know, they they kind of uh, operate in isolation. You can have two or 200. Uh, one doesn't know about the other. They have no idea that there's any others. They don't share state. They don't do anything. So anytime when you're doing just general reporting, you know, uh, some HR comes down and says, hey, we need to know, you know, what this user did on this day great, I have eight servers or 10 servers. Now I got to go run this report on each of them. And, um, you know, I mean, yeah, there's some things you could do with PowerShell and, and, and things like that. But at the end of the day, that that is, you know, kind of clues you. Also, those the reporting database is just one aspect of this, as you had mentioned. Um, and, and it's important, but one of the things that I think this tool is going to be really important for customers is having at least a high level visibility of configuration or, you know, uh, being able to look at certificates because that's it. That's probably the number one issue for always on VPN outage is this certificate expiration. Uh, being able to know, hey, you know, uh, is my IP address pool close to, uh, to the limit rather than just having it fail? Uh, let me know. Hey, I'm, I'm you know, I've assigned, I've assigned a slash 22 here and, or 23 and and I'm running up against the upper limit of that. Maybe I need to expand that address pool or add servers to the pool. Maybe there's a server that's misconfigured. You know, I, I look at all of the, the one screen you showed was fantastic where it shows the ports. I can't tell you how many times I've solved problems for customers where we've had 10 servers. All of them were configured with a thousand ports, but somebody missed it on one of them and it was configured for two ports or 100 ports or 128 ports, whatever the default is. 
And so that would very easily show here. I would say, oh, look, there's a misconfiguration. Let me go fix that. So um, yes. this is going to be a fantastic, going to be a huge win. Can't wait to see it. Uh, can't wait to uh, get it in the hands of some of my customers. I already have a long list of customers that are uh, in the queue for uh, first availability of a, of, a, of a preview. So looking forward to seeing it soon. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks for all your hard work on that one. That's fantastic. Uh, it's a team effort. <laughs> uh, so, um, got onto the the Q and A. So, please do uh, if you've got any questions about AOVPN DPC or the the new reporting solution, please do um, add them to the chat, and we'll we'll get to them. I see. I would, what... I would also I would also add Leo any other questions at all. So, if you join the chat, if you join the chat, or if you join the webinar, and you yeah. have other questions unrelated to those, we're here. We've got yeah. some time. We're happy to answer your questions. Yeah, can't uh, guarantee a good answer, but we'll certainly give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but we do have one question from uh, Dennis, uh, who's just asking, can we confirm that uh, we don't need Intune um, for DPC? I'd take that from, from the demo. And mm -hmm. yes, I can 100% guarantee um, if you want to use Intune, great. Um, but this product at its core, its base was from customers going, I don't want to do Intune or I can't do Intune or any number of reasons and I want to do it on prem and there's just no good ways of doing it right now. And that's where DPC really came from. Um, so you, while we were kind of demoing the, the Intune piece today because that's what's new and shiny, um, right. you can 100% do it without touching the cloud. <laughs> You're right. Uh, the the genesis of of um, uh, of DPC was Active Directory uh, managing always on VPN client configuration settings using Active Directory group policy in the classic way, right? Um, and uh, that's how I viewed it. It was a great solution, but I always thought it was just it was just a niche solution. But ultimately, when Microsoft introduced support for custom ADX, ADMX, that just uh, uh, made it that much easier. And of course, we demonstrated that today. But you're absolutely right; the solution does work, uh, um, um, uh, Dennis, with uh, just native Active Directory and Group Policy. Um, we've got a question uh, for yourself, Damien, um, around um, does the report or will the reporting solution work um, or is a uh, reporting or uh, will it work with on-prem VPN servers or just Azure? Oh, um, uh, either. So long as it's got uh, line of sight out to the, um, uh, the Azure storage um, uh, account. Mm -hmm. It's fine. So it can either be via a proxy. Um, it's effectively no. It is so long as it can communicate to the Azure storage account and dump its information there. Yeah. Um, then, uh, then Power BI then accesses the uh, storage account and then pulls the information out and does its wizardry. And I would uh, to clarify that, and in, in, in uh, the questions a tad unclear. Uh, the assumption here is we're using Windows Server Routing Remote Access or RAS servers for VPN. Uh, if those are hosted in Azure or on-premise, which we don't care, that will still consume that data. But if you are using Azure VPN Gateway or Azure Virtual WAN, this solution does not work with those. We are specifically talking about an RAS reporting solution yep. here. Yep. Um, and currently we have a dependency on an Azure storage account to act as that middle host point. Yeah. Um, in theory, if there was a de enough demand, we could look at alternative approaches to that. Um, but at, the, uh, at least at the V1 stage, there will be a requirement for the customer to have a, an Azure storage account that we can uh, communicate with. I assume if a big enough customer comes along and says, I want to host this on AWS storage, you can, you can probably accommodate that, huh? Yeah, well, ultimately Power BI yeah. is a very, very flexible and powerful tool in terms mm -hmm. of where it can be rigged up to. Got um, it. At the moment, the way that we are rigging it is for an, an Azure storage account, but in theory, yeah. Um, yeah. it's just blob storage with a proprietary API on the front. Makes sense. Really? Yeah, and then a table table storage then for the performance data. So. But again, theoretically, a large enough customer, we can um, <laughs> solve that in other ways. Very good. Yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, any any major new features in Windows 11? What's the what are your thoughts on that? There's a new UI. Depends yeah. on whether you define <laughs> that as a major well, and, feature. And I guess the question is, is a bit ambiguous, right? Yeah. Are we talking about DPC? Are we talking about VPN? Are we talking about Windows 11 in general? Uh, for I, I'll address the Windows 11 VPN aspect of that. Uh, certainly no new major features. There were some incremental changes recently uh, with updates to the CSP to expose a few more settings. But other than that, uh, always on VPN on Windows 10 and Windows 11 is functionally the same. Um, DPC in theory should work with both, but obviously as we described on this webinar, uh, due to uh, the bug in Windows 11, uh, it was not immediately available. To, DPC didn't immediately support uh, uh, Windows 11, so uh, without a, a great deal of work and, and effort uh, from the Power On folks, uh, um, we would have to have waited till Microsoft fully updated all of their bugs, and they still haven't done that yet. So anyway, um, but yeah, that's that's kind of where we are with that today. Uh, so from a, if we look at it slightly more generally, um, there's a new UI, um, there's some arguably some really good stuff around the Azure AD side, and I know that our um, end user compute team are excited in various ways for the management mm -hmm. capabilities through all, mm -hmm. all of that side of things. But fundamentally, it's all the same core that it's all been since kind of Windows 8, 1-ish kind of era, and it's just <laughs> kind of iterative um, yeah. improvements over the top. Yep. I see there's a question about TLS 1.3. So can we limit Windows 11 to TLS 1.3? Um, I would assume so, yes. Uh, though that's just managed by registry keys. Um, and certainly when, when I implement uh, VPN servers for customers, we do restrict that to, um, well, usually TLS 1.2 and 1.3 because they may still have some Windows 10 clients around. But if you're doing always on VPN, uh, with Windows 11 and you have a server 2022 back end, must be server 2022, then you conceivably could restrict that uh, to exclusively TLS 1.3. But it's important to remember that TLS 1.3 is not supported today on Windows 10 for RS. So you, if you're using SSTP, you have to support TLS 1.2 on, on uh, older versions of Windows Server. And uh, do we have any plans to add US-based um, resellers for customers with procurement requirements? Um, I believe that you have um, acted as a reseller in the past. I have, you? yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I, it, it not in a, any formal way. I, I think I'm doing it just out of convenience. But certainly if a, if, if a customer wants to purchase licenses, they can, they can do that through me. I'm happy to take a credit card payment. I don't necessarily have a formal like website to do that, I'll just send you a link that uh, through my payment processor that that you can input your information. Uh, can do ACA, uh, ACH, we can do bank transfer, we could do uh, um, credit cards as well. So, um, but of course that question is still important to me because I still have to pay you in some way and that's always kind of a pain. So I would love to see some sort of portal even for us resellers. <laughs> so, but yeah, I anybody on the call who wants to purchase licenses, on that, yeah. actually. Great, that's fantastic. Um, so yeah, I have to reach out to um, our finance lady uh, for the for the lowdown. Wow, oh, that'd be fantastic. That that'd be great. Yeah, for me personally, um, when I'm uh, uh, reselling licenses, of course, I have to uh, pay via via bank transfer, and that means an actual trip to my bank. You know, so oh. <laughs> if it saves me that, if I could just pay it with my credit card online, I don't have to get up and go anywhere, and uh, and and. It, make it easier for me. But yeah, I have had customer feedback as well, similar where um, they would love to be able to just have like an online portal where they could buy the licenses directly from you, even if they don't buy them from me. But again, if anybody wants to purchase licenses here in the US, I, I, I am technically a reseller. Uh, feel free to reach out. I'd be happy to provide you with a quote. Lovely. I think that that is all of the questions for the moment. For the moment, I do want to add one more question, Leo, that we got on Twitter, if you will recall. Sure. We had uh, we had a uh, Twitter user ask a question about always on VPN with non-Microsoft infrastructure. Specifically, oh, yes. I think they were talking yep. about Cisco. And I want to elaborate that, elaborate on that. Yep. Uh, the answer is out, well, taking DPC out of the equation momentarily. We'll talk yep. about that in a second. Uh, always on VPN is infrastructure independent. You can make it work with a non-Microsoft infrastructure, meaning I could use a Cisco iOS router, 
um, firewall, uh, anything like that, Palo Alto. There's all, all sorts of any third party VPN. There are some requirements, though, that must be met to support non Microsoft VPN infrastructure. And in the case, this this particular user asked about Cisco VPN. So let's go that route. So let's say you have a Cisco firewall or router. You want to configure it for VPN. Uh, or I should say firewall, not router. Uh, if you were doing a Cisco firewall and you want to support always on VPN, you can do it. One of two scenarios play out. One of two conditions must be met. You must either first use uh, Ike V2, in which case when you use Ike V2, you must use the native Windows VPN client. Um, you do have the option also of using the plugin provider. So the plugin provider is basically a Windows Store client for Cisco that you would install, and that allows you to do always on VPN as well. It's not as common, but it does uh, allow that. The advantage to the plugin provider is that it does allow you to support uh, TLS, so you can use SSTP, but if you're using the native client, you must use Ike v2. Now, and, and so if we talk about adding DPC onto this, DPC does not work with plugin providers. So in the case of DPC, you can absolutely configure always on VPN to work with the VPN, uh, a Cisco VPN, but then you must use Ike v2 as your VPN protocol. Uh, but other than that, yes, absolutely. You can definitely use DPC and always on VPN in general with uh, a Cisco VPN infrastructure, no question. Yeah, and uh, fundamentally, it's if you're looking at the kind of original XMLs and things, if it says native client in it, then ultimately DPC doesn't really care what the back end is. Yep, um, doesn't know or doesn't know or care, right? Yep. No, um, it's just that we don't support the native plugin tags at this time. Sorry, the non-native yep. plugin tags at this time. Um, correct. Yeah, the plugin providers would be a totally different animal. I mean, you, yeah. in theory, you could do that, but I don't know about you, uh, Leo, but from my experience, using the plugin providers is very limited. I've been doing this for many, many years. I think I've done one or two deployments where we've used the plugin provider. Pretty, it's, pretty rare. Yeah, it's not something that we uh, regularly come across. And um, what's more is the documentation is um, <laughs> lacking, to say the it, least. It, nil. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah. ultimately, um, in theory, you could do it with the override XML, which, oh, but it's not yeah, a great true. answer. Yeah. Um, well, ultimately, but, that kind of defeats the whole purpose of DPC of streamlining that because then you'd have to write your own XML. Yeah. Um, so, so that becomes problematic. Right? Yeah. So one of the key problems why we can't really commit to supporting plugin providers is because the, the documentation is next to nothing and what's more is we have no real way to provide assurances or support services around that stuff um yeah. so it would be very challenged and and also it then gets into the point of well we um we're a relatively biased um implementation at the moment we assume that you are going to do things like have mps servers and um <laughs> yeah. uh, you must yep. do things like uh, the certificates um stuff and yep. we'd have to make all of that kind of optional in that circumstance so from a ui perspective i mean group policy is great um but it's also very limited in the types of uis you can create with it <laughs> yeah no question looks like we have one more question here looking to migrate always on vpn from direct access uh can dpc streamline and simplify this process what are your what are your thoughts yeah. So I would certainly say that it has its advantages um, over kind of the native approach. When I, back in the day with kind of direct access implementations, I did see somewhere they had to go from a one kind of stack to another stack um, for, for various reasons. And what they actually did with that was that they um, unlinked the old group policy and they linked mm -hmm. the new group policy in. And mm -hmm. then when the the policies all updated it just downed all the original stuff and brought up the new stuff and in theory you can do something very similar with dpc you can get the agent preloaded on you could even preload all the con config apart from the enable this tunnel flag mm -hmm. um and you can do it that way. Now, AOVPN and direct access, you can just about run them side by side if you're careful enough. It yeah, most of the time they get along okay, but sometimes they don't. 
yeah yeah it, it's certainly something that you want to thoroughly test before <laughs> before you do a, a a mass rollout and i would add to that from experience that yes they do get along most of the time but sometimes they don't but even when they do don't you uh, my my best uh, my best suggestion is get a get away from direct access as soon as possible. You definitely don't want to leave always on VPN and direct access on the same endpoint <clears throat> any longer than you probably 100%. have to. I would I would do it and 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 I would just monitor those connections. And as soon as you have evidence that that client has always on VPN and they've connected successfully, remove the direct access client settings as quickly as possible. Yeah, just gonna save, just gonna save a lot of pain. <laughs> trust us. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, a lot of a lot of unattended uh, side effects when you have both VPNs running at once. Most of the time, you know, when when you deploy always on VPN, direct access just drops off. Even if direct access comes back up, usually it takes over, right? Because you have NRPT and everything resolves to IPv6 addresses, and so it goes over the the direct access tunnels. So in most scenarios, I've seen it. You know, one or the other works, and you don't have to worry about it. But I have encountered more than uh, one in one scenario where uh, they would kind of fight like cats and dogs and be problematic. So, lovely. Um, Very good. So, um, for uh, if you do like what you see here and you'd like to to get some more information, then do check out our previous blogs, demos. Um, we should be putting some in the chat now. Um, and if you've got any more questions or you would like to, to know more, then hit reply to the email that you're going to get after the session. Um, and if you like um, all the stuff that Richard's kind of been talking about and you'd like to get some more detailed information on a kind of a more personal and longer form basis, uh, then do check out his um, very awesome, I think, is it four day? Um, it is a this is a four day training course. So I've been delivering three day training courses all over the world for a number of years in person. Um, but I've had a lot of folks uh, asking about virtual training opportunities. So I've partnered with uh, the folks at the uh, Via Monstra Online Academy. So if you, you're probably familiar with them. Uh, because they do a ton of stuff around SCCM and Intune training. And so they've asked me to uh, deliver this training class through their platform. So looking at doing that uh, mid-April there. So if you want to sign up, um, yeah, just visit academy.viamonster.com and uh, register. See, to, by the way, it's a virtual class, but we are still limiting space because I still have to build out the virtual labs for it. So I don't want to build out, you know, 40 or 50 servers. <laughs> so uh, we are going to limit that. So if you're interested in that, sign up soon. Lovely. And uh, above all, thank you all very much for joining. Um, what we'll do is we'll get the, the questions um, written up so that um, people can kind of see that, you know, kind of a longer form approach um and um yeah reach out um if you've got any questions outstanding thanks everybody for joining us thank yeah, you very much you. have a uh, great day all right cheers everybody Take care. bye now